Okay, I think um, we should probably start uh, getting going. Um, I'll kick things off. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, some of you might have heard this already uh, if you joined right at the start, but I'm Matt Bass. I'm the Executive Director at Datasite. Um, this is our third uh, webinar in a series of three. So um, it's been a great um, series of webinars and really focused around the Make Data Count initiative and bringing things together. I think really ending it off with an exciting um, group of speakers um, and, and moving the conversation forwards. Um, I think I, I should also add, um, maybe at the start, just to, to mention that for Datasite, this is really important as a global community that really focuses around connecting research, identifying knowledge, and, and that's bringing the disparate pieces of the research lifecycle together. And specifically here, we're talking about um, the recognition of data and the, the reuse of data um, across the scholarly um, scholarly um, within the scholarly record and, and across the community throughout the research lifecycle. And so it's really exciting to um, be continuing the conversation. There's lots of work that we're still doing and, and if it's underway and um, hopefully today we'll have um, a great, um, great set of discussions um, following the speakers and, and look forward to engaging with you all. With that, um, I'll hand over to Stephanie, who will briefly introduce each of the speakers and be leading the session. So I'll go off camera in a moment and um, look forward to hearing the speakers. Over to you, Stephanie. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for starting us off here. And thank you everyone for making the time to join us today, um, particularly our speakers. So I just want to kick us off to, um, and you might have heard this already if you're uh, journey, uh, joining this uh, series, have joined the series before, I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Make Data Count initiative and the kind of context we're having this conversation in. So today our uh, third and last of the spring uh, webinar series is entitled Begin, Metadata for Meaningful Data Metrics. And uh, just a bit of housekeeping. So it's really uh, great that you're introducing yourself in the chat. Uh, if you have questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A function because then we can really pull out the questions. Um, and that's what we'll do in the second half of the session today. Um, be mindful. Um, so use the comment if you, uh, function if you want to, but be mindful that it might be distracting to speakers. Um, and we're also really encouraging you to follow up discussions on Twitter, um, and you can use the handles Make Data Count and Data Site. Uh, and uh, Data Site will also be be um, tweeting the session. So. Um, what is Make Data Count? What is this initiative? So we're a scholarly change movement um, committed to ensuring that the way data is used and cited is open, transparent, and um, responsible. And um, who is behind this? Where we are a collective of organizations uh, such as DataCite, um, Crossref, and the California Digital Library, and individuals uh, such as me and, and researchers who are dedicated to the development of open data metrics. Um, how do we want to do this? Um, well, we're a lot about building open infrastructure and uh, community-based standards. Uh, we advocate a lot about the, the value and the importance of uh, the role that data plays in the research life cycle and acknowledging uh, its reuse. And we also, and this is particularly me and Isabella Peters, who we're going to hear later on, are um, working on a research project where we want to contextualize and actually provide evidence base uh, from a bibliometric, but also a qualitative point of view to um, build in the end meaningful metrics. Um, and we were based on, on values. Uh, so we're doing all of this open and open and transparent way. And we want to build metrics that are responsible. So we certainly don't want to repeat uh, mistakes from the past that, that we've seen in terms of impact factor or age index. So the focus here is really on developing metrics. Um, but uh, we, we're really an in, uh, initiative and we've already established some standards. Um, so Skolix and uh, the counter um, uh, research data uh, code of practice. 
And we're really uh, advocating the use of these standards in developing metrics. And we're really on a journey. Uh, and this journey um, uh, you know, has been going on for a few years and we still have a lot of work ahead. Uh, right now we're at the stage that we have identified some best practices in terms of data citation and data metrics. Um, and we wanna work on uh, ad adopting data citations. And we're also working on the contextualization part in terms of research. And that's really what we're here today uh, discussing about like what kind of metadata do we need? What do we need to take into account when we wanna build metrics, which is kind of the, the end of our journey um, where we think that um, data metrics could really help incentivize researchers to share data. So to really value research data as an output, similarly to journal articles and not having to write a paper about the data, but the data being a standalone and valuable um, output. So the um, Meaningful Data Counts uh, project is a, is a sub project or research based project funded by the Alfred Pete Sloan Foundation. Um, that is led by uh, me as the PI and Isabella Peters as the co PI. Uh, we have funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to generate evidence on data sharing, data reuse, and data citation. And we're doing that with a mixed method approach um, based on bibliometric analyses, um, but also uh, surveys and, and more qualitative uh, interviews that we're um, starting to set up right now. The survey data is being analyzed at the moment. We're pretty excited to share that soon. Um, so that's kind of just the context of uh, what we've been doing and the context of uh, why we thought having a webinar series on these kind of topics involving the community and discussing these points would be really important. So I'm really, really uh, thrilled to have four great speakers and panelists here today um, that are gonna provide their multiple perspectives um, on metadata for meaningful data metrics. So that's my uh, quick introduction here. Um, and now I'm really excited uh, to pass it over to our first panelist, to Christine Borgman, who is a distinguished research professor in information studied, studies at UCLA. So over to you, Christine. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation, which is uh, actually very well-timed for the kind of work that I've been doing. And I want to first set this up with a very old problem in scholarly metrics and use a very new case involving uh, this beautiful plane, the uh, stratospheric observatory that flies uh, for far infrared astronomy. I've been working with astronomers for, uh, for a number of years now. So here's the old continuing problem, is to think about how metrics influence behavior and including scholarly behavior. Goodhart's law is a way it's commonly phrased, but you'll see it with very, various other names. The general idea is any metric is going to be gamed. And the more it's gamed, the less good a measure it becomes. That's always been an issue, it goes back very, very far in bibliometrics and citation metrics. But now so much is at stake when publisher parish becomes impact or parish. I mean, not only are people getting hired and promoted based on these kinds of scholarly metrics, whether data metrics or publication metrics, they're getting big cash prizes in some parts of the world for publishing in journals above a certain threshold. So the incentives to, to game these are absolutely huge. So that takes us to uh, my case study that I wanna talk about here. Uh, the Sophia, which has been flying for eight years now, was just in the last few weeks publicly canceled by NASA and by its German partners. Now this never happens. This is really unusual. Once something, once a mission is up and flying, it generally gets to complete its entire mission. But this is being canceled eight years into a 20 year lifespan. Now you can never know the full picture of why this is happening, of course, but the public arguments about why it's being canceled have to do with scholarly metrics. And because of that, uh, some of my uh, partners in astronomy who have put very substantial parts of their scientific lives into this observatory at, uh, came to me to discuss how they might respond and what's going on here. And this slide is a result of, of that conversation with, with several astronomers. Now notice on the left, the claims from uh, the National Academies, from NASA, 
a study commissioned by Nature, all come down to saying that Sophia fails on a metric of the number of dollars it costs per paper that is produced, okay? Now, the one that Nature compared it to were ground-based telescopes and Hubble, which is a space-based telescope. Ground-based and space-based do very different kinds of science, different kinds of metrics apply. And Sophia is a bit of a poor cousin because it flies on the 747. Comparing it to Hubble is also uh, problematic because it is, again, a very different kind of mission. Hubble has been in the sky since 1990. It has more than 30 years of data. And as a space telescope, it's up there 24 seven collecting data. Where Sophia is limited to the amount of flights it can take, it effectively can get about 25 hours a week or about 600 hours per year of on the sky time. So, uh, Hubble gets about a hundred times as many hours of actual observing time per year as Sophia does. So if you compare Sophia to Herschel, which is another infrared observatory, Sophia looks very good. And in the first third of the mission, it's getting a very good growth in all the usual metrics and has a undisputed major scientific uh, breakthroughs already. But about half the papers from Hubble and from Chanda and other big old observatories that have good data archives behind them are coming from the archives. So if you compare directly a new observatory like Sophia to an old one like Hubble or Chandra that have had time to build up this archive and actually use that archive itself for, day, for paper production, you get a very different kind of comparison. So we've got eight years of data in the archive and already we're getting more and more papers out of Sophia archive uh, as, as it builds. But there's a real critical mass question here that we should be thinking about as well. So that takes us to what I really want to pull all these pieces together and talking about data metrics and metadata for uh, data metrics is that we need to recognize that all metrics are going to be gained by people subject to them. And that includes not only the, the authors and the publishers, but includes the funding agencies. There's many uses to which these are going to be put and people choose ones that are advantageous uh, to them. So any metric we end up with is going to advantage some people and it's going to, to disadvantage other people. So the criteria for meaningful data metrics and metadata for meaningful data metrics needs to include questions of, of who benefits by them, who's disadvantaged by them. We need to think about the opportunities to game the metric and something that we deal with very much in the privacy world as well is who will watch the watchers. And whatever metrics we come up with, we need to see how they're used and we need to observe them. Things like retraction watch are very useful, uh, but we don't have those all the way across this, uh, this field. So let me stop there and thank you. I want to put up some of the sources just to make sure they get in the record uh, because we like bibliometrics and we like, uh, we like sources and good metadata as well. So I hope that's enough to get us off and running of thinking about what some of the criteria should be for uh, better metrics for uh, scientific data and scientific scholarly communication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine, for this wonderful intro and a great case study showing us really and a concrete example of what can happen with bad, bad metrics. Uh, also, just as a note, uh, the slides will be shared later on on Zenodo, so then people can also look into the references as well. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll move on to our next speaker now with his introductory statement, um, Rodrigo Costas, who is a senior researcher at CWTS in Leiden University. So hello everyone, hello Steffi, nice to uh, see you all. Um, I will then share quickly my screen and please double check that you can see it. Um, you see everything? Ah, 
Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks again. Thank, thank you for well for, for this opportunity to 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 have this this panel this conversation with uh, yeah with speakers of, of the of the level of, of Christine of uh, Nicolas of Isabel. So this is really really a privilege. And uh, from my side, I would like to take the say the the the, 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 the very yeah centometric perspective. And to do that, I would like to um, somehow reflect on a, on a work we did, uh, well, quite some time ago with uh, Paul Bauters and other colleagues here at, uh, at CWTS. It, it was the, the, at the time the, the, the knowledge exchange report that we did to, to, well, to, to think on how we could develop uh, data metrics uh, from, from a quantitative and uh, uh, yeah, an analytical point of view. And at that time we did a, a quite thorough reflection on what kind of metrics we could uh, uh, produce, we could uh, elaborate for, for uh, data, for data sharing, for, for data sharing activities and data outputs. And I mean, trying to, of course, summarize a lot, in a way, we, we came up to, uh, to, uh, with the conclusion that, um, in essence, we can produce very similar metrics as we do for scientific publications. We can have metrics related with the outputs, for example, the number of data sets that have been produced. Uh, we can also uh, uh, produce metrics related to the impact of those, uh, of those data sets, including citations, but not only citations, also downloads, uh, shares in, in social media, and other types of metrics, I mean, more, more in the realm of, of uh, metrics that uh, today we're also uh, applying for scientific publications. And not even just there, I mean, we can also think in metrics uh, about collaboration, about how scientists collaborate each other to produce data, uh, what are the different thematic uh, uh, perspectives that they apply in their in their in their data creation from topics disciplines and and, and subject categories i mean subject disciplines that they they somehow relate to their data production and of course also metrics related with the trends i mean how data production is growing or or, or evolving over time and at that time we realized and, uh, i guess this is one of the key elements of, of the discussion today is that in order to be able to produce all these metrics uh, we really need to have traceable and comprehensive comprehensive metadata so essentially we need proper information on who are those creators of the databases uh, sort of the data sets who are their affiliations and what are the different properties of those data data outputs they are they are producing and in essence, the lack of this metadata, the lack of this uh, uh, somehow compre comprehensive sources on, on data sharing, uh, kind of led us to the idea that there was a sort of data sharing business circle in, in this process. So essentially you have researchers who produce data, but somehow they don't uh, feel that this is going to be rewarded, that this is going to be valuable. So they don't feel it's worth investing the, investing the time in making this data uh, available, more, more accessible to others. Then what happens is that there are not that many outputs that are, I mean, data, data sharing outputs that, that can be measured, that can help to, to, to um, can be used to produce uh, metrics to, to, to be analyzed by a metrics and then makes it difficult to, to measure it and make it visible, which in itself also keeps the, not encouraging researchers to share their data. So in essence, we enter into this vicious circle. So then we are also at the time and, and now we, we also keep thinking how can, can we somehow change this, uh, this, this situation? How can we uh, create a roadmap to, to develop these more meaningful data metrics. And of course, the first step is, 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 is the important one is that we have to place, we have to, to in a way, present data sharing and, and the production of, 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 of data as first class research products, I would say at the same level as we do with, with scientific articles. We then also need to increase the attribution and traceability of these uh, data sets. Uh, using PIDs or, or DOIs, uh, including data on affiliations of the, of the creators, uh, publication dates, uh, types of contributions uh, to, uh, regarding that uh, production of data, and so on. And uh, for example, I always wonder this, why, I mean, we always claim our affiliations in our scientific articles, but Sometimes you don't see this in, 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 in the production of data. It's not clear who, I mean, researchers don't always include their affiliations in, 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 in their production of data. Uh, of course, all this also needs to be indexed in, 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 in some of the major data infrastructures. I think data side is, is, is probably the, the, the largest and, and, and the best one, but there are others where scientists could also try to, to report their data production. And 
uh, again, doing the, the comparison with, with articles. So we do care a lot about where our articles are being indexed, but so it seems that we don't care that much when, when it comes to where is our data being, being indexed. Then there is another important step that is we really need to pay attention to the quality of the metadata. So the possibility of, of analyzing, of making visible these data sharing activities strongly relies on the, the, the quality of the metadata that describes that uh, those, those data sets. So we need to think in a standardization of, of metadata fields like the data creators, their affiliations, the publishers, the dates of, of, of the production of those, of those data sets and, and so on. And of course, the completeness that we, we have as, as, as much as complete data regarding uh, the producers and those data sets. And finally, there is also important uh, conceptual challenges. For example, when, when it comes to count and, and measure uh, the data sharing and, and data production, we also need to think on how we're going to operationalize that concept of data. Uh, I mean, it's not the same a data set that is, for example, a collection of uh, photographies than, for example, data that has been simulated uh, by a computer. So we need to keep all these, uh, the, all these questions in, in mind. So then having this roadmap in, uh, roadmap in, in mind, then we could think in a sort of, uh, oops, uh, did I stop my presentation? Oh yeah. Let's go back. So we can also think in how we can uh, somehow turn this uh, vicious circle into, into a more virtuous circle. So then we can, instead of, having researchers that are not encouraged, that are not uh, yeah, uh, oriented towards producing their data. But we, we, we try to, to, to approach researchers from a point of view of recognition and reward of, of their data sharing practices. So we tried, I mean, I would say, at least we try not to, not to penalize them for producing the data and possibly we try to, to, to reward them for, for, those, for those activities. So that would essentially create more traceable information, more, more, more uh, yeah, critical mass of, of data sets that are being published, that are being uh, recorded, that are traceable, which can also help to somehow change the culture of scientists so that there is more activity regarding training uh, students, new PhDs in, in the use and the sharing of the, uh, of the data which also in, in, in essence will also help us to measure and make this, these activities more, more visible. So, so essentially by ma making those activities visible, we'll measure them and we help to transform the, 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 whole, the whole process. And well, I hope these are, this is enough ideas to, 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 to move to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Lots of ideas. And I think uh, we, we're going to have a lot of questions and things to discuss. Uh, so now we're going to move on to our uh, third panelist, uh, Nicolas Robinson, Robinson Garcia, who is a Ramon y Cajal Fellow at the Information and Communication Studies Department at the University of Granada. Well, thank you very much. Um, I hope you can see my slides. Yes. Um, well, thank you very much for having me here and, and letting me join this, this panel and share some ideas. Um, well, I, I would like to, to share my thoughts basically, with in, especially with relation on how we're going to use these data metrics and how they can be incorporated both technically, but also in, in terms of, of, of research assessment. Um, and uh, while when we, when we see these data sources as someone who comes also from, from the field of scientometrics, we really embrace them with a lot of excitement because it allows us to see things. Um, but I've, I always wonder if, if, if these new metrics may add, may become just something more than researchers see that they have to do and can become an increasing burden, like more tasks that we are putting on top of them. So I think that is something we should uh, really think about when, when thinking about data metrics and how, how they, they will be used or gamed, as we were talking, as, as, we, as uh, Christine mentioned before. Um, another idea I would like to share with you is this idea about the cost of sharing data versus publishing papers. Uh, sharing data is also costly, so it's not only just producing it and collecting it, it's documenting it, it's making sure that it's reusable, that it's uh, that the, the, the analysis that we're publishing in our paper can be 100% reproducible. And, and, and even if this is something that is, that is recognized at the same level as a paper, it may actually be something that researchers prefer not to look into because they may think it's, um, it's more cost effective to continue their career doing publishing papers and not sharing their data set um, or citing them. 
also citations, I think that could be is something that we have to, to think about on the conceptual meaning of, of citing a data set. Uh, one, one reason to cite a data set would be because we are actually using it and, and reusing it. Um, and that means that it's, it will be much more costly to get citations from data because it means that there's, it's being used by more people rather than citing papers. So the cost of someone for using data sets it, it will, is different from just citing a paper that has been published else, elsewhere. And in this sense, well, um, well, before we go to this, um, one thing, one answer could be that, well, maybe we should think about this in terms of diversity of scholars. So maybe we shouldn't expect every researcher to share the data or to be the people who are actually gaining the credit for it, for this, but actually think in terms of diversity of profiles of researchers who do different things. And maybe there is a, a minority of researchers or a majority of researchers who are actually doing these things and which are not currently recognized in the in the, scholar, in the research assessment system. And maybe this is where actually data metrics will, could help uh, to visualize this, this kind of work. And one of the things that have, has already been mentioned by my colleagues is the idea of metadata. Uh, I think that's, that's really, really, really important, not only to be able to analyze the data, but also to make it, to be able to integrate it with other data sources. This is, these are just some, some screenshots from, from a study we did where we were trying to look at uh, individuals uh, collaborate um, sharing data using ORCID. Um, and uh, and uh, well, here you have some examples where we could get the data and how we did it. So we could get data that was connected through through data side to, to ORCID, through FigShare, and then from a specific repositories. And here the, the idea of identifiers is essential to be able to connect these different databases and to be able to, to, to um, well, to get that metadata that may be missing in a, in a data bank from, from other sources. So maybe all the information from the authors can, may come from, from ORCID while well, we get the metadata from the data set itself from, from the repository. Of course, here again, we have the issue of, of completeness and, and of coverage. We, we can look into these sources, but, but we, of course, we, we are missing a large majority of people and probably also the, the, the records are not completely um, full. And in this sense, um, other things that, we, that, that, that we're working uh, on my end is, is in this idea of contributions and on profiles of researchers. And we do find actually that those who are performing the experiments, which would be those who are, we expect are doing the field work and collecting data and processing data and so on, those who are actually um, be, uh, the, the ones who would be sharing data are relatively young from what we see here in, our, in, in some of the studies that we've been conducting. And this may be because this is something that is age related, but also it may be because actually these people are not being represented by current evaluation systems and data metrics may give them a way actually to find a different career path within academia that, it's, that is uh, certainly um, needed. Um, and here, well, uh, one, one of the, that's, that would be one of the hypotheses, you know, that data metrics could be a solution actually to find different paths um, from different um, types of research, you know, because we always tend to, to approach scientometrics and, and research evaluation in general as a kind of a one path, one size fits all type of, of design where we have to um, assess everyone um, with, uh, uh, in the same way, this means that whenever we find a new metric, something that may shed some, uh, show some light in different sides of, of the sphere of what we do, like uh, with the case of data metrics, we just put it on top of the researchers instead of saying, well, maybe actually we may find researchers doing different roles and following different uh, different career paths. And then, well, I just wanted to, to end up with a bit of self-promotion. This is actually a project we're working on with, uh, with diversity of, of projects. Another platform which which we're very interested on, on looking at is actually the open science, frame, uh, science framework, yeah, uh, where we, they're actually showing all of the products that can be produced within the framework of a project. And, and that could be also something to integrate within this ecosystem of, of, inf of open infrastructure that could serve as looking to research outputs beyond, beyond publications. And uh, that would be all from my end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas, for this really interesting perspective of like 
roles of contributorship and providing credit to those that are producing data. Um, so last but certainly not least, I'm happy to introduce uh, our fourth panelist, uh, Isabella Peters. She's professor of web science at the SEP BW Leibniz Center for Information Economics and uh, University of Kiel, um, a colleague and longtime friend. We actually studied together already a long, long time ago. So thank you very much, Isabella, for um, your contribution. Yeah, thank you very much for the, well, for the invitation. And it's also a great pleasure for me to be part of this really nice panel and it's good to, it's always good to meet friends in these kinds of um, webinars and occasions. Yeah, and now my part is to report a little bit um, about our quest for meaningful indicators for research data as um, Stephanie had um, introduced us to in, in the beginning. And what I really like is that our quest really has a great motto um, because it really explains the core of our research project already. And that is to make data count, we need meaningful data counts. And we have heard uh, about these meaningful data counts uh, already for quite a bit. But I would also like to show you why we think um, it is necessary to have this kind of context information and meaningful, um, yeah, meaning, meaningful context information to produce uh, good data metrics in the end. And let's see whether this is working for, with me today. Hmm. Ah, so here we are. <laughs> um, and I think I can be quick uh, on this slide because we have heard about uh, the incentive system uh, already. I think uh, Steffi has introduced that in, the, um, in, in her first slides, but also Christine has talked about it. Um, and we know that metrics and indicators are powerful tools to change behavior. And they are really great incentives. Um, and whether this is good for whether this is for the good or for the bad uh, really depends on their design and along with it uh, on their validity. And we know that as soon as countable units are out there, people or managers or whoever will take them and they will start to count them and they will they will start to develop indicators or metrics because it's just too easy. And we hope that with our research, um, the, the scientific community will not make the same mistakes like in the past, and we hope that they will learn from our evidence that uh, um, metrics are not all in the world and that sometimes we just need time uh, to work out um, what would be good metrics. And what we've seen is that uh, right now we still need more research on dis disciplinary data reuse and also um, of disciplinary data citation behavior. And also, that is, uh, I think, something what also um, um, Rodrigo has shown before, we, we need a critical mass of context information and metadata um, to, to be able to build the indicators and to make um, meaningful comparisons. And what I want to say is that, uh, well, in the end, we have to investigate the territory first before we can come up with metrics because we need to know what is available and what is common practice already. Um, and after that, we can build new metrics. And um, so when looking at DataSite, for example, which is one of the largest providers for DOIs for research data, we have found that only 6% of data sets, um, which can be found in DataSite, have disciplinary information with them. Um, so that is really not much, yeah. And also, the, the the overwhelming majority of research data has not been cited at all. Yeah? So ninety nine percent has not been cited at all. And I I just posed the question to the audience: Is that enough information for us to start the development of indicators? I doubt that, but um, that was maybe something for the discussion. And. We have also started uh, with investigating where research data comes from. So that is to which disciplines um, the research data belongs to according to data site. And what we can see here is that the majority of this little data <laughs> from what we know where the discipline is from, it stems from the natural sciences followed by medical and health sciences and then the social sciences. But um, as you can see, just in the bottom line, almost, well, uh, those, those research data sets that are cited often do not contain any um, discipline information. So, so we do not have a lot of information here at all. And 
even for those that are cited, the information is still uh, less. So again, I want to challenge you when asking, so what, what does this tell us for the construction of indicators in the end? Will it make sense to compare the natural sciences with the agricultural sciences, for example, which are the blue on the right? And I know that for some of you, these might be <laughs> very much with rhetorical questions, but in the end, we are already confronted with people that develop data metrics or research data metrics. And um, well, that is the territory we face right now. And we, we as bibliometricians have to think about whether the indicators make sense in the end. And what also still is an open issue, because we are talking about uh, disciplines here, um, the open issue is whether um, disciplinary classification systems that are made for scholarly articles or scholarly journals, whether they are really transferable to data sets. Um, we don't know that yet, yeah? Right now we try, we try that, we try to classify data uh, by using journal classification systems, for example, but whether this is a good idea, we don't know. So I would say, and given that this should be an impulse for you as well, so I challenge you here, I would say that as of today, we can be quite confident to say that the world is not ready for data metrics yet. And, um, <laughs> um, and at least it is not ready for those metrics um, that should be used universally across different disciplines. Um, also, and I think that is something uh, which uh, Rodrigo touched on as well, um, the term data or data set is quite ambiguous. And as you can see in this example, and I hope you can see it because I can only see my, you, you know, my colleagues here on the right hand side, I hope you can, <laughs> can see um, the differences. Okay, thank you, Rodrigo. Um, so both of these data sets are labeled data set, but they are quite different in terms of the number of authors, for example, the license under which they are published, the file size, the data collection methods, and so on. So they're quite different, but they're all called a data set. And in the end, again, we need to, to discuss what is a countable unit, as you said, Rodrigo, right? So that is, that is the same um, discussion we had when it came to um, publications, because we also have some kind of idea of whether a tweet is a publication, or the whole book is a publication, or the journal article, or whatever. So we have the same problems here. And also, in terms of impact, uh, we do not know yet um, if and how those characteristics of data sets also impact reuse and citation of the data. Um, and again, from citation studies, we know that um, yeah, citation counts are affected by at least 28 factors. Yeah? So that all somehow um, affect later citation counts. And we have to find out whether this is true for the data sets as well. So yeah, I think um, to summarize, here, we definitely need more information on data citation practices in order to come up with meaningful metrics. And if we want to avoid comparisons of apples and oranges, oranges we also need more metadata and context information in this regard. So I guess that's what I wanted to say. And thank you very much. And I hand over to Steffi. Thank you very much, Isabella. Um, for this great context and summary of what we've been up to in the uh, Meaningful Data Counts project. And thank you to all panelists uh, for providing their perspective. We're now moving over to the Q&A session and I wanna start us off um, with a question that we prepared. Um, and we also, if we have time left, we're gonna get to the Q&As in, in the Q&A box. So please add your questions. We're also gonna follow up later if we don't have time for it. So I'm proposing that we'll keep the same uh, speaking order. So Christine, Rodrigo, Nicholas, and then Isabella. And uh, our first question would be, what are the, the next steps on the journey towards meaningful data metrics? Um, and what are really the biggest obstacles? So Christine, if you could provide your perspective on that question. Uh, I think that one is, is pretty straightforward is, and I've added to the, the Q and A, is that people reuse data without citing them. And we've seen, we've published heavily on exactly that point is uh, they don't seem to, well, there's a number of problems in there, but the, the fundamental issue is data reuse is much, much heavier than any of our indicators show. And so incentivizing people to do the citations is a threshold 
before we know what to count. I mean, just like anything to do with the COVID numbers, we believe these are grossly underestimated what the, what the true numbers are. So there's some incentive issues there. And then there's the, the gaming issues that have been uh, several people put in here as well, that people are concerned about themselves being gamed as far as their, their uses and reuses of their data. And they're, they're, they're afraid of being scooped. There's a free rider problem. There's the, the incentives are absolutely huge in here. Thank you very much. And, and just maybe a plug for our first of the three webinars where we really uh, discuss that too in depth in terms of the signal we're getting in a formal citation versus the overall, you know, acknowledging of reusing data, for example. Um, Rodrigo, next, please. Yeah, yeah. From, from, from my side, I think there is a, an urgency in making these activities visible, in which then metadata uh, infrastructures that, that uh, index that make uh, the production of data visible are fundamental. But they really must take a, a, a very serious position here. So it's not just creating, uh, as Isabella very nicely shown, I mean, it cannot just be we have the publications with or, or the data sets with the DOI. That needs to be with complete metadata. So authors are properly identified, their institutions are properly identified, uh, the content of those data sets are, are, are also properly identified, and that will create visibility for these activities. And my expectation, as more or less I try to do with my well, reversing the vicious circle would be that that visibility and the measuring of those of those activities will create an, an, an environment where incentives and rewards can be created to to promote these activities. So, so for me, that would be the very first uh, step. Thank you, Rodrigo. And uh, Nicholas, next. Yes, well, I, I agree, and I think that um, that even before even going to citations, is just being able to to identify the the, the data sharing the public data sets and trying to find these activities also the issue that Isabella mentioned the types of, of data sets or whatever we call them what are they because the cost uh, the use the, the diversity there is huge even within, within and between fields and um in some in some i mean the the, the cost of, of of sharing data and, and the and the difficulties even if ethical difficulties will be very different depending on the fields and, and even the use the use of reusing it or not uh, will will change. I think that in that part we still have a lot of work to do, even before looking at impact. Yeah. And Isabella, can you provide your perspective on what should we do next, and what are maybe the biggest obstacles? Well, there's not much left to say, <laughs> I'm afraid. But this is well, this is good. So I agree with everyone, and I also think that the um, like the the practice of reusing and sharing and um, citing data. Um, and making this visible and having that as a like a, a fully acknowledged way of um, doing scholarly work, this is I think the major step. And I know that this is you know due to organizational change and probably this is also the hardest part. <laughs> um, but I think we need that. Yeah, and I really like uh, how everybody emphasized in the sense that. Um, the incentives are lacking, right? Like we're not supporting researchers uh, and not valuing enough data sharing. And then it becomes what Nicholas also said, a, a burden, an additional thing to do uh, because no policy is requiring it, but it's not really helping in the larger academic reward system and in, in the career. And in that sense, it's not a priority. And that's where, at least from the Make Data Count perspective, we're hoping that uh, good and responsible data metrics can help with this kind of incentivization. But we, especially the, the vicious circle and the loop that Rodrigo kind of showed, while well, we're a bit stuck in the sense of like, we want to develop good metrics to incentivize, but if the metadata is not there uh, to build them, um, but we have to start somewhere, right? And uh, yeah, it's really good points. Uh, thank you very much for, for answering that question. I, I do have another one before we go to the um, questions from the uh, par participants in the Q&A. So um, my second question would be, from your experience with bibliometric indicators, and we have decades of experience with that, um, which are mostly based on journal articles. Uh, what are some lessons learned and advice for developing metrics for research data? So maybe given uh, looking ahead when we're there, when the metadata is complete, and we know a bit more about, um, you know, like 
research data citation and the patterns behind that and the um, motivations behind that to cite or not cite data. Um, what are kind of lessons learned when we're actually thinking about making or building an indicator? Um, Christine. One would be to make it as simple and discreet as possible. I mean, um, it, let's see, Rodrigo has mentioned one that I've talked about much in, in other venues about the difficulty of defining what the unit is of, of a data set that we're going to cite. And that's a classic problem for us. But we pretty much agree on what a journal article is. And yet the citation of that is extremely uneven and dirty. I keep pointing people to Zotero and I think we're now up to 10,000 or more different citation styles for journal articles. So we can't agree on how to cite a journal article. We're a long way from agreeing on how to cite a data set because we don't agree on what the data set is in the first place. So anything we come up with has to recognize that people are going to cite it inconsistently and we have a real risk of dirty data to clean up. And that takes us into a lot of other things. Uh, I've got a couple of new pieces in that area and I'm gonna put them into the chat to, to pick up as well. Thank you very much, Christine. Uh, Rodrigo? So I would I would I would start by saying that I mean most of the developments that are reflecting and questioning uh, citation indicators, impact factors, age indexes. I mean, I'm thinking like the manifesto Dora. I think all of them apply to to any new metric that we are, that we develop for 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 data sets. I mean, I cannot imagine anything that would be radically different. So uh, all of those principles, uh, most of those reflections do apply. And having said this, I mean, I also take a much broader perspective when it comes to data metrics. So for, to me, data metrics is a little bit more than citations. I mean, for example, for me, uh, something that would be very interesting is to study collaboration patterns in the production of data. Something that today can be challenging because the, the, the data about the authors is not, is not properly standardized or is not even complete. Uh, well, we already discussed the thematic uh, thematic base indicators. No? How, how can we say if an area is growing in production of data or not? Because we don't have those uh, 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 those, those those pieces of information. So, in a way, I, I would say, inspired for what we know from uh, from our centometric research and centometric development, I think there is a lot we can apply to uh, the data metrics, and all the lessons learned for, for articles basically apply for that. And probably once we are in, in, in that somehow improved or better situation where we have infrastructures to capture, uh, properly capture data metrics, then probably a specific problems will come. And then it will be tough time for us to also rethink the indicators we're proposing, what could be the challenges like like, like Christine was pointing. So when, when the indicators stop being useful because somehow the purpose now is yeah, lost, and it will be that time. But for, for the time being, I think what we have learned from our centometric work fully applies to, to data metrics. Thank you. And Nicholas next. Yes, I think that also there are, there are some assumptions that I think that are dangerous that we make with the data. If we just translate, let's say, the conceptual part, which is always the weakness of centometrics, the theory to, to, to data metrics. So the idea that um, yeah, that citations mean something um, specific when 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 done into data sets uh, that producing uh, data sets are is something um, let's say that um, let's say homogeneous in, in terms of efforts and so on um, I think we need much more qualitative studies there to think about how data uh, is produced why how people recognize uh, the skills that are necessary for people to 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 share data and so on um, before that, I mean, for instance, uh, maybe a bit off of the record here in, in Spain, we see that since we have to write a data management plan to apply for funding, um, many, many senior researchers basically don't know how to do this. I mean, they don't have the skills, they don't know where to, how to make their data open, what are the, the priorities or the, re or the requirements that they need to do this, this kind of tasks. So it's, there is a lot of literacy there, but also a lot of understanding how, how they do things, how, which are the current practices that they have there. 
Thank you, Nicholas and Isabella. Yeah, well, again, I think I agree uh, on, <laughs> on all terms. So this is really a nice spot here, <laughs> last in the row. Um, but maybe to add something different or a different perspective. Um, so I think we should ask ourselves what we want to do with the metrics when we have them in the end. Because um, again, what do we need them for? I, I know there should be in, in incentives and they should help us do something, but we should be more clear about what this is in the end, um, because then we also can build, again, meaningful metrics or we can really have a, a good validity in this regard. Because what I, I don't like the idea of, um, you know, just building or constructing or designing metrics or indicators just because data or something is available or in our case here with data metrics it's not available right now the metadata <laughs> um, but again we would be i think we would be um, um yeah we could be more specific about what metadata for example we need when we know for what reasons we want to have an indicator or a, a metric so i think we should yeah start thinking from from the from the end in a way Thank you very much uh, to all panelists and for answering these great questions. We have so many uh, great questions also in the Q&A, uh, but I, I worry that we actually won't have time to go through them all. Uh, but please don't worry, we're going to save them and follow up. So we're sharing uh, the, um, the recording here, but we're also uh, uh, going to share the chat and the Q&As after. So thank you very much um, for, for the excellent discussion, uh, the contributors by the panelists, but also for everyone uh, participating today. I'm just going to hand it over now to Daniela, who's going to uh, follow up with a little bit more of the follow-up <laughs> that we have planned. Thanks, Stephanie, and thanks to all of you who spoke today. I think your perspectives are invaluable, um, and I hope that folks are able to follow along all the work that you all are doing um, and especially the projects that you noted. So if you have any other links, put them in. Make sure um, it goes to everyone and not just hosts and panelists. I know a lot of things are coming just to us. Um, so we will be saving the chat. We have posted and um, perhaps Paul can put in the link here for um, the Zenodo stuff, but I'm putting a link in here to chat now with the links. We do have a page on the Make Data Count website that links to the recordings from the past uh, two webinars. We will be posting on YouTube the recording of this webinar. It will then be linked forever on the Make Data Count site, and you can also find it through Data Site in their channel. Um, so the metadata of all of this will be caught there as well. Um, so we encourage everyone to go back, watch the recordings for the first two webinars. I think they all kind of culminate to this one um, and go back. So it's great to watch all three and see how they come together. Um, this isn't the end of us doing outreach in general through Make Data Count, um, but in virtual times, so we thought this would be good to kind of capture what are the big three things that we want to highlight and that was understanding how to surface data citation understanding how to get a better classification system for data and what metadata we need for meaningful data metrics so um, these are kind of the priority areas we're all working through right now and please get in touch and follow along as we continue to um, work through all these efforts again we'll leave um, the screen on for a second so that if you want to grab the link again here here it is again um, <laughs> and we will follow up with all other information so thank you to everyone um, it was a pleasure to see you all here yes thank you all thank you to the panelists <laughs>